namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Oh, just in case some of you are, are wondering what this um, little exchange is that happens, sort of esoteric dialogue. Uh, um, at the, the very beginning of the uh, Dhamma talk, um, probably many of you are, are familiar, maybe some are not, but this is a, a, a traditional way of um, uh, requesting that a Dhamma talk be given. And uh, you might have looked at the, the translation in the uh, in the chanting book, and uh, uh, what it derives from is uh, the in, an incident that occurred, according to Buddhist mythology, uh, shortly after the Buddha's enlightenment, when uh, after all of the uh, uh, the eons of, of um, the Buddha developing the paramitas, the spiritual virtues, then having finally arrived at full and complete enlightenment um, and contemplating the, the subtlety of the, the truth that he awakened to and the, um, the extraordinary and abstruse nature of, of um, that realization and um, sensing the uh, kind of, uh, intractable sickness of human beings. <laughs> Uh, literally, uh, the, world, the word for a, uh, a worldling in Pali is a putujna, which literally means a, a fixer <laughs> or a thickhead. So that's what it means. Putujna means a thicky. So the Buddha, uh, his first inclination was, there's no point even trying. <laughs> and so his his first thought was, uh, you know, if I try and, and share this insight that I've, I've discovered, then this will just be wearisome and, and troublesome for me and um, it won't uh, won't do any good. So his first thought was not to even try and teach. But then, uh, which is kind of an interesting after all those eons of preparation, <laughs> <laughs> that it was, uh, yeah, that was the uh, his first thought. But then, uh, as it said, the, one of the Brahma gods, um, the Brahma Sahampati, uh, who is the, the um, in Buddhist mythology is the the creator god, the kind of CEO of the universe. There. And uh, uh, the Brahma Sahampati picks up this thought in the mind of the Buddha and thinks, you know, oh no, the world will be lost. The world will be utterly lost. You know, cause the, the mind of the newly awakened Tathagata is inclined towards inactivity. So... <laughs> beams down from the Brahma world and appears in front of the Buddha and uh, bows down. Venerable Sir, um, there are, indeed, there are many fixers in the universe. (laughs) Uh, But, it's also true that there are a few beings with only a little bit of dust in their eyes. And so, for the sake of those with just a little dust, then please um, share the... uh, the understanding that you have awakened to be, be so kind as to to endeavor to explain and expound the Dhamma for the sake of those, uh, the the, uh, the lightly dusted. And so uh, uh, the Buddha then, as the story goes, cast his vision around the, the world and, and, and realized, yeah, you know, Sampati is right. There, there are a few with just a little bit of dust in their eyes. So for the sake of those, and he he consented to uh, to teach, so we are the inheritors of that uh, wonderful motivation that uh, the Brahma Sahampati 
uh, had all those um, those years ago. And so this, uh, the, ever since then, you know, uh, following in the footsteps of the master, um, there's a hesitancy to share the Dhamma. <laughs> okay, an official hesitancy. And so that it has to be coaxed forth you know, on every occasion, which is also why um, you know, Buddhism is a non-proselytizing religion. Uh, we have a whole principle of not sort of knocking on people's doors and uh, or stopping people in the street and <laughs> sharing our insights with them. You know, we we might look, we might walk down the street and look highly noticeable, and you know, be ready to attract attention and be a sort of flag flag waving flag-wearing Deva Dutta, a heavenly messenger, but um, we're not allowed to invade people's space uh, un- uninvited. So it's that, uh, I find it's a very beautiful tradition whereby that's still the way that uh, Dhamma talk is, is invited. So I don't presume that you want to, to hear things that I've got to say, but uh, then there needs to be that catalyst of, of uh, uh, stand-ins for Brahma Sahampati or come forth and you know, these are hard times, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the uh, Buddhas are hard to come by, and Brahmas are also pretty rare. But uh, you know, we're still we're still in the ring. Well, one of the the questions that was asked uh, somebody asked today was um, uh, actually a few people. Uh, it came up in, in conversation a few times as to uh, how can how can I know how well I'm doing or if I'm making any progress on the path um, and uh, that's a common enough reasonable enough question isn't it I mean, we'd like to know and this particular person said that you know he'd been an accountant for his working career and like was used to having a checklist <laughs> and I have a checklist to see you know okay how am I doing with my practice? And that'd be nice, wouldn't it? You know, okay, how many other hindrances still present? Sense desire, <laughs> ill will, you know, doubt, you know, restlessness, dullness. Okay, all the hindrances are off. Very good. Okay, factors of enlightenment, mindfulness, tick. <laughs> investigation of dhamma, tick. Um, energy, tick. Tranquility, tick. Concentration tick. Uh, probably missed one, haven't I? <laughs> Loving kindness tick. Equanimity tick. The um, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it, just to have a a barometer meter. You can, you, know, you can have a like one of these really sort of fancy little pocket MRI scanner. You could just sort of get, you know have a little bit. Okay, how are we doing? You know. And just sort of get a measure of, of, of where we're up to in our spiritual progress. And, yeah. Actually, uh, last year I was at this, this conference at, at MIT with um, the Dalai Lama and a whole crowd of um, uh, mind scientists. And they are actually doing MRI scans and sort of these 256 electrode um, EEGs. And you know, they can, they can you know, track the area in the brain where exactly where compassion is generated. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the spots exactly where, what you, the way you can detect, um, uh, uh, kind of open, open awareness, uh, under, you know, un- undirected awareness, the kind of little spots, you know, little red patches and blue patches on these brain scans. So it's not completely out of the scope of the possibility that we could have little detectors that will tell us. I'm sure they'll be marketing them within you know, a decade or so. I've already seen adverts for having you know, aura balancing equipment. <laughs> so uh, we would, that'd be nice, wouldn't it, just to be able to have a little gadget that would tell us where we are. But even, no matter how accurate the gadget might be, there would still be that um, uh, that doubt, wouldn't there? Like, Is this really accurate? <laughs> Maybe the batteries are on the blink or. Yeah, I thought I was doing better than that. Oh, I can't be that bad, can I? Well, uh, even in the time of the Buddha, there was this um, uh, there was a a sense of um, 
interest or a, or an urge to, to, to know where where someone is at, where, where we are at in our practice. There's one um, very uh, one of these the classic exchanges between the Buddha and Ananda. I think it comes in the Parinibbana Sutta, the uh, the description of the Buddha's last days, and um, they've been staying in in some one of the large towns, and and Ananda starts to ask the Buddha, you know, um, what the uh, what the place is, what sort of realm various different people have been reborn, you know, disciples of the Buddha. And um, and you know, he starts to ask about this one and that one and this and the other one. And and, um, and then, you know, how many stream enters there are, how many once returners, how many non-returners, how many arahants. It goes on and on and on in this way. And then uh, eventually the Buddha says, Ananda, there are many people who pass away <laughs> every day. In in Saketa and Savati and um, Ujjaini and Kosambi and you know, all these these places and uh, and if you're going to ask me about where every single one of these people has been reborn, this will be wearisome and troublesome, <laughs> vexatious for the Tathagata. <laughs> so then he says, Ananda, if you want to know, you know, a surefire method for for uh, figuring out, you know, whether someone's a stream enter or not, or whether they've been where they've been reborn then you can apply this teaching called the mirror of the Dhamma. And um, the, what it comes down to is very, very simple, really. It's just, you know, if someone has uh, unshakable faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and if they're pure in virtue, then you can, you can definitely say that person is a stream enterer. So, Ananda, go. <laughs> Take that and figure it out for yourself. But uh, doubt is a pervasive quality, isn't it? It can it, it arises so easily, and um, it's and it's something that um, can be quite burdensome, and difficult to deal with. And it can be doubt about um, you know, sort of where we might have reached or not have reached in the path, or it can be doubt about you know, all kinds of other things, different aspects of, of the practice. And and so doubt as one of the, the hindrances. Um, uh, the uh, the Buddha compared um, to I think it's uh, when he, he compares the, the the five hindrances to to concentration to different um, to different kinds of water. He said sense desire is like water with dye in it and that um, ill will is like water that is boiling, bubbling with heat. Um, that uh, restlessness is like you know water that is blown by the wind and is all wavy. Um, doubt is like water covered with pondweed and scum, kind of murky. And that dullness is a really good one. Dullness is like muddy water put away in a dark cupboard. <laughs> a bowl of muddy water. So it's not even just muddy, it's actually muddy and in a dark cupboard. <laughs> it's a bargain. So doubt, uh, but uh, as I remember it, uh, uh, the, uh, the the mind, mind filled with doubt is like that sort of nice you know, algae covered pondweed, <laughs> pondweedy water, kind of slightly rank and, and thick. You know, can't see through it. And so that uh, it can easily be a, a, a substantial obstruction to the practice, just that not quite knowing if I'm doing the right thing, not quite knowing um, how to handle something, not quite knowing um, what's true, what's not true. You know, the mind can burn a, a huge amount of energy in uh, in states of doubt. You know, am I uh, am I doing the right thing? What's my intention here? Uh, And so, um, one of the most, uh, and because we are, particularly in the in the living, growing up and living in the West, we have minds that are trained to think. You know, we actually are schooled to uh, and encouraged to 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 speculate and to doubt, to create ideas and to to juggle ideas and be able to sort of uh, manipulate concepts. Uh, to uh, actually trained to. Uh, 
uh, to debate around pointless subjects. Ever though there isn't any, any of you went to a school or university debating society, and you just pull a <laughs> pull a subject out of a hat, and it would be something like Napoleon was right. <laughs> and then it's either your job to oppose it or defend it, and, and so you make up an argument uh, off the top of your head for something that you have absolutely no interest in whatsoever. And you might not even believe him, but it's your job to defend it. So we come up with an argument. So we actually have a, like an education system in a society that schools us to have opinions about things and to, to create, uh, po- to take positions and create arguments uh, about things, even when that's very insubstantial. So it's no wonder that that the, with the mind sort of steered in that way and, and guided in that way that it's continually able to grab things and just create problems out of them. Like, am I doing the right thing? Is this, should I be doing this? Is this right? Sh- should I choose Bengal, Bengal spice or peppermint? <laughs> and that we can find ourselves sometimes quite paralyzed or, or can completely stricken by, by what's the right thing to do. Should I change my posture? <laughs> Whether it is nobler in the mind to bear this agonizing knee pain to uh, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous knee pain, or to take you know, arms against the sea of troubles and move my posture and get rid of it. What should I do? In the, in America, they have a a, a name they have, you know, of uh, that feeling that you get when you go into the supermarket and you're confronted with 18 different kinds of orange juice and 53 times types of bread. It's called option paralysis. <laughs> Where your mind is just frozen, and, uh, can't choose. There's too much, too much to to pick between. So um, it it can it can be very profitable to to contemplate doubt. And why you know why doubt is listed as one of the hindrances to samadhi is because we can just get so buried, so lost in in these kind of questions. Not you know what kind of bread we'll <laughs> we'll choose particularly. But you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe you're already thinking, cocoa or Bengal spice tonight? No. Now, last night I had the Bengal spice, but then I kind of took a long time to get to sleep. So maybe the cocoa would be able to chocolate is a stimulant, though. So maybe, maybe they got some decaf cocoa. Maybe I should ask. The, no, I don't, don't want to bother the managers now. But, but that's their job. They're supposed to be managers. They're there to help me. But I don't want to be difficult. Maybe I should write a, a note to Ajahn Amaro and say, Ajahn Amaro, what should I do? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't have any doubt about that. So the, to, it can be so helpful just to understand and to work with, with, with doubt because what, what happens, as, as you might have noticed, is that when the mind comes up with a question, a problem, like that, then it's as though we've got a, a piece missing, isn't it? Like there's a gap. Like well, there's a, uh, we're like a question that's uh, missing its answer. Like this incomplete thing, like an ambulatory question. So looking around, and, we, and we, we want to find our answer. And just like with a desire, you know, you want, we, we want to have that thing, and then we'll when we've got our, our desired object, then we'll feel complete. Similarly, doubt is, is rather like we've, in a way, become an embodied question. If I just had my answer, if someone would just tell me, you say, yes, <laughs> you are doing the right thing, yes, stay with the breath, or no, no, you are doing the right thing, let go of the breath now. <laughs> but uh, if I just had my answer, if someone could just tell me, then, then I'd be happy. So we feel like we've got this missing, if we just could find our missing piece and then slot that into place, then we will be a complete thing and then, and then we will be content, we will be at ease, we will, we will be whole. So the problem is that we, we buy into the, the question and the more sort of um, juicy or philosophical or unrequitable the, the doubt is, the more that it's impossible to, to really know then the more that the thinking mind um, feverishly endeavours to come up with the right answer, we try to think our way 
rationalize our way to the right answer. Um, and the, the more adept you have, the more of a, a, uh, of a kind of active and competent thinking mind that you have, the worse it, <laughs> the worse the problem. Right? So this is where, where cleverness becomes a genuine curse. And that, um, if you have a, you know, a pleasantly, you know, simple and, uh, uncomplicated mind, it's that you can only go, the range of possibilities is quite, <laughs> quite comfortable and small. If you've got a fertile, creative, brilliant mind, then it is <laughs> the papuncha, the field of conceptual proliferation stretches out in an immeasurable vista in all directions. So we we think, we try and think our way to a solution. What should I do? What's the right thing? And we think and think and think. And then we come up with a, you know, a, 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 a finally we, we come up with a logically tight, perfectly uh, comprehensive and complete solution to our doubt. Okay, now I know that's the way it was, so this is what I should do, right? But then, if, going back to the, the the inner lawyer that I was talking about the other day, it's like a it's like a sort of an inner court battle, where the uh, you, you know one lawyer you know, makes the case, and then the other lawyer says, "Milad, <laughs> objection," <laughs> and then the other lawyer sort of wades in and does, makes the whole case for the opposite, uh, and then. Uh, completely uh, opposes that particular, you know, watertight solution that you thought you had, and suddenly you realize there's all kinds of holes in it, and you've got to kind of <laughs> so, yes, but what about this, and what about that, and on the other hand, there's this, 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 and this, so then, okay, <laughs> and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, you know, the, the mind, the thinking mind continues to try and make a case that will, will stand up and be whole and complete, it'll be the, the right thing. But my experience is that you can't think your way to the end of a doubt. I've got you know, one of those irritatingly fertile minds, <laughs> and, I, and uh, even if you're doubting whether I'm, what I'm saying is realistic or not, I, I can assure you at least <laughs> you can think and think and think for days and come up with a with a whole uh, yeah, absolutely convincing solution, and then, and then there's that niggling little voice that pops up and says. Yeah, but on the other hand, <laughs> yeah, there could be things that you haven't even thought of yet that might be at play here that you're, you're just suppressing so efficiently that you don't even know that they're there. But it might be the real thing that actually matters. And all the rest is, all of this verbiage that you've come up with is just a smoke screen for that real thing, the real issue that you're just hiding from. So, so completely in denial of, you have no idea what it might be. But it could be there. Ah, shut up. So on it goes, back and forth and back and forth. So the the um, the most helpful way to work with doubt, I find, and and, and uh, Lumpur Sumato has been an extraordinarily good teacher in this respect, because um, my mind does, is not terribly prone to doubt, but when I do when I do get one, it's usually a real stinker. <laughs> it can go on for days or weeks. So. What uh, what you find is if you start out with a principle that you can't think your way to the end of the doubt, because no matter how perfectly you, you, you think, there's always that, on the other hand, factor. So um, the, 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 most, uh, the most effective method, the only real method that I found that really works, is to, to recognize that when a doubt presents itself, it's saying, I am incomplete. I've got a piece missing. I'm missing my answer, and when you come up with the answer, when an answer has arrived that fits the, the gap, and kind of slots into the the the, uh, the bit that's missing, then I will be complete. So we believe that scenario without without question, right? That, you know, that, that a doubt arises, and we think, I, you know, this is incomplete. I need a, I need an answer to 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 be whole. But when we look at it in its essence, actually that's not the case at all. That's not that's not really what's happening. So uh, a number of years ago, again harking back to the past as an example, many years ago when I used to share the office here at Amaravati with Ajahn Atapemo, the two of us were monastery secretaries. We sort of did, did the job together. 
he was uh, officially he was secretary of the English Sangha Trust, and officially I was the secretary of Amravati. But we sort of overlapped a lot, and we shared the uh, the office together. And so uh, we did this for two or three years, and um, I started to notice that I had a lot more responsibilities than he had. I seemed to be taking on a whole variety of different tasks, um, whereas he just seemed to be able to sort of stick with his, you know, the, 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 the stuff that he was working on and, and not get drawn out into, you know, solving you know, other issues around about the monastery. And so uh, I, I was perplexed as to how he was doing this. The rat? <laughs> how come I end up with all the jobs? You know, we you know we still, we're both there. We both seem to be sort of attending to people when they come in the door. Because as you know, probably most of you know, those who live at Amaravati, you know, when you've got a problem, whether it's a you know, tile coming off the roof or a leaky drain pipe or a, a boiler that doesn't work or a, uh, a teaching engagement that needs to be fulfilled or or uh, somebody who's gone sick or transport that needs to be arranged, you go to the office. <laughs> and so that um, what would happen would be with everywhere. In the, in the office together. Someone would come through the door and they would say, oh, I don't know, or they'd say, oh, uh, we've got a boiler that's gone out in the monks Bihar. we need to fix it, or um, we need transport to get sister so-and-so down to the, the doctors, or we need um, uh, to someone to, the, the roofers to come in and fix the roof on such and such. And I began to notice what was happening was that when someone would come in with a question or a problem, then I would well, the way I would respond to it was say, "Oh, well, okay, let me let, you know see if we can find a roofer, or, or um, what, what kind of boiler is it, or um, you know, well, you know, well, what time does this have to go, and and uh, you know, and uh, is the is the van being used today, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. I would I found that I was sort of picking up the problem, you know, in the terms in which it was offered, and I began to see that what I don't have to pay most of it, bless his heart, but when someone came in and said. Same sort of thing. The, you know, the roof's coming off. <laughs> what, what, what are we going to do? And he would say, "Good question." <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I noticed him. I thought, "Does he always do that?" <laughs> and then the next time, you know, as you know, people are aware, there's a lot of traffic through the office, and that several times in a day then these kind of things would come through the door and I noticed that almost invariably whatever it was his response would be good question and I thought you rat <laughs> <laughs> and so whereas I was sort of un- unwittingly sort of picking up the problem and making it mine like then I, you know, I was suddenly find myself responsible for solving it or finding a, uh, a solution to it he was just saying you know yeah, good question. How are you going to answer that? <laughs> yeah, what, what are you going to do about that? And so um, it was one of those simultaneous, simultaneously impressed and irritated <laughs> feelings. But it was also quite insightful. I, I really appreciated it because the um, the the thing that I could see was that yeah, I'm just picking out the question and I'm sort of answering it in its own terms. But what he's doing is actually seeing that. This is a question. This is a whole thing in and of itself. But um, it's not really got a piece missing. That in itself, this is just a question. This is some description of a particular aspect of the universe, and it's like this. So uh, then you, you realize that this is the same way with, with the doubts that we experience internally. When it says, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? You can respond in the same way good question. <laughs> but I've got to know, I've got, I've got decisions about my life to be made. I have to, to, you know, should I go, should I stay? Good question. <laughs> but this is a really important problem. I'm not just fooling around. This is not just some kind of random theoretical issue. I've got a serious problem. My knee is hurting. <laughs> should I move or not? Good question. So that by that at least momentary refusal to buy into the, the, the kind of demandingness of the doubt, to say that this is actually a question, the feeling of, of, a, of a question, it arises, it states its peace, and then it fades away. 
And what you, what you, what you, we discover to our amazement is that when the question fades away, nothing is missing. Isn't that strange? <laughs> and um, now it's not that we always just sort of ignore every problem and the things that you know that are, are requiring us to be involved one way or another. It's not just evading responsibility. But what we're doing is just taking a step back from that and, and not buying into it in, in its own terms, so that um, we we're in a way noticing the space around that question or seeing that that is a particular feeling that's saying, well, it, when it's in existence it's saying, I've got a piece missing but actually it's a whole thing, it arises it does its thing, it says, answer me answer me, answer me <laughs> and then it fades away and in some respects nothing is missing once it's faded many, uh, many years ago, again, there was a, a, um, a monk in this community who had been uh, when he was a, a teenager, he was uh, very obsessed with the. Uh, he was very pious, very religious, and um, his family was kind of sort of materialistic, scientific um, parents. But he was driven by a very strong religious sense, and he was very uh, a devout Christian. And then he went away to university and uh, was studying mathematics and. But he became obsessed with this doubt as to whether God really existed or not. And uh, his mind got completely uh, caught up with this question. Does God exist or not? Because, you know, I have this very strong faith, but then if God doesn't exist, then this is all a waste of time. I'm completely missing the point. And his, his mind latched onto it and became completely obsessed with this question. Does God exist or does, uh, does he not? Until it was just burning away, day and night. Yeah, and uh, incessantly. And then uh, he said he woke up one mo- morning. He was living in the student apartments at the university. He woke up one morning and just sort of went to the bathroom. And sort of halfway through making his breakfast, and he suddenly realised, oh, I've been awake for twenty minutes, and I haven't worried whether God exists or not. Mm-hmm. And then he had the insight: if I don't think about it, it's not a problem. Now, you might think, well, that's pretty evasive. But it, it hit him like a ton of bricks. Like, oh. He, really, he, he saw that, that uh, what made it problematic was the way his mind grabbed the nature of reality and was trying to figure it out. So then he became a Buddhist. <laughs> so when we, uh, when we experience a, a doubt, the mind... Uh, filled with a particular question or, or taken up with a, with a problem what should I do? what's the right thing to do here? then the the way to respond to it is the first thing to do is to, to recognize even though it's, it's telling you that it's got a piece missing just to recognize no, this is actually a complete thing in and of itself and when you allow it to uh, and sometimes uh, and what I've experienced is sometimes the uh, it it can be extremely irritated. It's like uh, there's this deep frustration of um, of the because if we get very identified with a problem or an issue or a doubt, there can be this deep kind of frustration or rage, like this question demanding to be worried about. And if you keep saying no, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into you, you get get quite heated. And, uh, and irritated that you're not believing in it properly. You're not kind of going along with the game. And um, But uh, if we just train ourselves just to, to watch it, come into being, do its thing, and recognize this is just a doubt, this is a question. Uh, it arises, it ceases, it's not self. Then we're, we're leaving space around it. And it's in a strange way, it's out of that spaciousness that the insight into what's actually going on or, or, or the way to respond or, or if some action is, is needed or not uh, will arise in, uh, with, from within that, that spaciousness. I remember one time I was um, 
on a retreat in the, the Hammer Wood, um, solitary three months retreat, uh, my mind had got particularly obsessed with a, with a, a doubt, uh, and I kept working with it in this way. And that was the reason why I was, was coming to mind about the sort of, you know, irritated frustration was that um, I kept, you know, l- letting go of it and saying, well, this is a doubt, it arises, it ceases, you know, it's not self. And so then uh, it kept, uh, but there was always this, this kind of, the, the, this doubt about the doubt. Well, you're just getting, you're just trying to, trying to w- wiggle out of this, aren't you? This is the clever way of not facing up to your responsibilities. And you're, you're just being a weasel. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was this uncertainty whether just working with it in this way was just you know, evading the, the genuine problem that I had to make some sort of decision about. Or whether this was really the, the, uh, the voice of wisdom that was saying, you know, that, that was speaking. Anyway, I, I remember quite clearly I was washing my arms bowl, you know, after the, the meal time. I was just by, by the little kuti in the, the forest, one called the Hampstead Vihara, up there in, in Chitta's forest. And I was just washing my bowl, and this was kind of, this doubt was sort of raging away in my mind. And, uh, and I kept saying, you know, it's just arises, it ceases. <laughs> it's just uh, another mental formation. Um, it's not, you know, it arises, it ceases, it's not self. And then it was like a, it got so intense, it was like a voice in my ear. And it, what it said was, if you excuse my language, well, I'm just reporting what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> what I heard was, listen, these are real problems that it's your responsibility to worry about. And I'll never let you rest until you admit it, you bastard. <laughs> and I thought, this doesn't sound like the voice of the Buddha. <laughs> the Master would not address his disciples in such a way. I suspect this is the voice of Mara. So after that, I was okay. <laughs> now it's a stra- it's a strange process, but if we, in, in a way, if we just allow ourselves to recognise the question as a question, like uh, one of the ways that um, uh, Brother David Steindl Rast talked about this, um, he's a a, a a Cistercian monk who also is a meditation teacher. And uh, one particular workshop he was leading about uh, monasticism, Christian monasticism and, and mindfulness and uh, the, the sensory world. And he uh, did this very, had this very neat way of talking about the, the three basic vows of Benedictine life of you know, poverty, chastity and obedience. And he kind of reframed them a little bit. So poverty he called renunciation and uh, chastity he called celibacy. And, but obedience, he says, as obedience. And he said each of these three is represented by a particular conundrum. And so, uh, renunciation was, was embodied in the conundrum when, uh, when I let go of everything, uh, nothing is missing. Uh, and then celibacy was represented by, uh, when I'm completely alone, I am fully at one with others. But then the, the one that, that, I'm, uh, that comes to mind in respect to this is obedience. And he pointed out that the Latin um, source of the word obedience is ob audiens, which means completely listening. And um, so obedience, he said, it's not just obedience to what the abbot says, but the, the spirit of the vow of obedience is obedience to the word of God in the Christian terminology. So, so the, but obedience uh, literally means to be completely listening. And then the, the conundrum that, that represents that, well, I found really interesting, intriguing, because the way he framed it was, when you drop the question, the answer appears. When you drop the question, the answer appears. So that means in, in the respect of what I'm describing, is that when you we recognise, ah, oh, here is a question. This is my big doubt. What should I do? Should I shave my head and enter the monastery? 
Should I stop shaving my head and leave the monastery? Should I stay in this marriage? Should I enter into a marriage? Should I leave England? Should I come back and live in England? Should I have Bengal spice or peppermint? <laughs> Should I change my posture? Should I tell that guy with the noisy jacket? <laughs> Should I write a note to the managers? That dropping the question is not suppressing the question, but as I've been describing, recognizing, ah, this is a question. It arises. It says its thing, sometimes with great vigor and vehemence. And this is a, a burning issue, a, life, uh, a, a life-changing issue. Yes. <laughs> Good question. What should I do? And that when we just allow that space around it, then we see that arises and ceases. What we're doing is that we begin to, to uh, in a way, I mean, it's, it's all analogies are partial. So we are allowing to ourselves to notice the space around that question. We're begin and in that allowing of to see the space around it, we're also realizing that the way that the question was framed was assuming a particular set of values or ideas or assumptions about the world. It's describing one little way of describing this particular set of experiences. Right? And we don't notice that we've shrunk the universe to this tiny little pocket. And that and because within that framework we're stuck for an answer. But what we're doing with this is like expanding the framework, expanding the, the ways of, of experiencing what's happening, uh, expanding the, the picture. And oftentimes when we, we, we drop the question, we let there be some space around it, then we realize, oh, that was the wrong question. <laughs> or, oh, there's no answer to this. Or it might be, oh, well, what does your heart tell you, dummy? <laughs> Do it, or just stop. <laughs> and what happens, is, I find when I work with, with doubt in this way, is that there's a, what arises, you know, as Brother Dave was saying, the answer appears. What arises, or what takes shape, is, is a, an, in, an intuitive quality that we haven't thought our way to. We haven't arrived at, at it by a, a, a sequence of logical steps but it's that there's a certainty to it just as if you put on a shoe that fits you know it fits you don't have to think oh it fits you don't have to think it doesn't fit you know directly there's no there's no doubt about it there's no thinking involved it's just ouch <laughs> no <laughs> it doesn't fit and so there's a whole different quality that uh, that accompanies that and and what and what might appear as I was just saying is that what might arise is this is not knowable it's foggy you can't see so no matter how many times you blink or how or, or, or you wipe your glasses you won't be able to see because it's foggy <laughs> it's not your eyes it's not your glasses it's foggy and so it's right now it's not knowable you can't see and so even to be able to recognize oh I can't know. This is, right now, this is not knowable. Oh. <laughs> we find ourselves able to be at ease with not knowing. It's not like, if I just keep thinking hard enough, if I, really get, if I get really, really worried, then I'll get myself to an answer. <laughs> but I'll be sure about it. No. <laughs> not necessarily. So the, uh, and there are uh, obviously ten thousand different things that we can we can doubt about. But it, in terms of of the the path, or in terms of of our practice, or you know, what we're endeavouring to do here, essentially, and what there's uh, the the doubt that's talked about in in terms of the um, characteristics of of stream entry, of the you know the first stage of enlightenment. It's the the doubt is not whether it be Bengal spice or peppermint, but uh, the doubt is what is what is the path and what is not the path to be able to to know to be sure what the path is and what the path is not, and so that in, in a way is of a uh, uh, 
a particular significance. So sometimes when people see that the, a phrase like getting beyond doubt, they that you know it's easy to to wonder or to to assume that oh this means if, if any kind of question arises in my mind, obviously I haven't arisen, uh, arrived at stream entry because you know if I was beyond doubt, I would instantly know peppermint <laughs> or <laughs> or move my legs now or you know it's not a question of never having any any uh, uh, uncertainty being experienced. It's not a question of, of there never being any uh, choices before us uh, or always being absolutely assured of, of of what to do in any one particular moment. But it's, it's specifically aimed at, at knowing what the path is. And so that in this respect, it's just a, a, um, a way of knowing it, uh, that was just kind of what I was describing, that that if a, a thought arises, there's a knowing. There's, this is a thought. It arises, it ceases. Here is a question. Uh, it arises, it ceases. Here is a feeling. It arises, it ceases. Here is a, you know, a burning passion. Oh, it arises and ceases. Here is a, an anxious uh, tremor. It arises, it ceases. Here is a feeling of identity. Here is a feeling of, this is mine, mindness. It arises, it ceases. So that knowing the past, it's simply that readiness to apply that insight moment by moment to see that you know, every uh, fa- uh, factor of experience, every facet of experience, it can only be a pattern of consciousness uh, that arises, does its thing, fades away, and, and is, is not self. It's, so it's a, a confidence from our own experience that, that that's the fact. So that that is the the true nature of things. So stream entry is is uh, characterized in, in several different ways in, in the scriptures. So it can be um, letting go. Uh, this classically it's defined as letting go of um, attachment to rites and rituals, uh, attachment to personality views, sakaya ditti, and getting beyond doubt. You know, doubt as to what is the path and what is not the path. Um, and yet, and so you know, these can all sound a little bit sort of you know, remote or, or um, out of reach. And uh, and there can be that doubt. Well, how, how do I know that I've got beyond doubt? <laughs> how can I know that I really seen through personality view or not? And uh, Ajahn Sumato would often tell stories of how he would. Um, he would be chatting with Ajahn Chah and he'd be trying to, to sort of trick Ajahn Chah into telling him whether he was a stream enterer or not. <laughs> and you can probably guess that was absolutely fatal. Since yeah, uh, Lumpur was, was uh, he had extraordinarily uh, acute antennae. So he could probably see it coming from about 100, 100 yards away. <laughs> and so any time yeah, Ajahn Smeda was sort of wheedling around to that or just sort of springing up the subject or sort of Leading into watching some sort of little remark dropped by Long Poor, he'd pick it up and really give him a run for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as he would, uh, he would end up saying, "It's the matter. If you need to ask, if you need to ask someone else to tell you, then you're still in doubt. And if you're still in doubt, you, you still haven't arrived at stream entry. <laughs> or maybe you have. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pushing us to to uh, to, to know for ourselves." Or, the other, um, another way it's characterized, as, as I was saying before, is that uh, unshakable faith in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and uh, and to have a in, impeccable um, sila, you know, perfect sila, in, in keeping the, the five precepts. Um, so that can also you know, cause us to, to doubt. And, and also, Ajahn, both Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Sumedha were very reticent of you know, talking about stream entry because, and, and levels of enlightenment and levels of jhana and so forth because it's so easy for the, for the gaining mind, you know, the, the, the competitive, achievement-oriented mind to think, oh, I want that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I've got to get there. And, and uh, that's what I want. And, um, and so then that very gaining mind, the very achievement-oriented, competitive mind, then that, uh, or as, as I was describing, the sort of becoming tendency, um, that then 
actually obstruct the, the, the effectiveness of the efforts that we're making that will bring about stream entry <laughs> and the development of John and so forth. The, the, the very sort of habit or uh, act of, of wanting it and pursuing it obstructs the very way that w- it would be realized. But it certainly is a, a uh, having even having said that, it certainly is a, a goal worth uh, aiming at, and that um, the uh, in Buddhist psychology that it's said that you know, that once stream entry has been realised, then um, one is reassured of uh, never being reborn in any of the lower realms, as an animal or as a ghost or in the hell realms. That you have a maximum of seven more lifetimes. Uh, in the human realm or, or higher realms and the deva realms, and um, you know, enlightenment is absolutely guaranteed within a, sometime within those seven lifetimes. That's a pretty attractive proposition. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's there's a whole um, sequence of of, su- of uh, suttas um, in a section of the Sangita Nikaya called the the section on the the breakthrough. There's also a whole big section on stream entry. But um, and the Buddha says he picks up a, a little bit of of earth soil in his fingernail and says, "What do you think, monks? Which is more, the earth that is under my fingernail, or the great earth, you know, the planet itself? Which is greater? Well, Lord, the amount of soil under your fingernail is very, very small." And the great earth is, is um, very great. <laughs> they are incomparable. There's no way you can compare the two. The, the one is, is, is vastly, immeasurably greater than the rest, uh, than the other. And the Buddha says, well, even so, monks, the, uh, um, the suffering that, you, um, that one who has arrived at stream entry can expect to, uh, to experience um, through the rest of their existences is comparable to the soil I have under my fingernail. Whereas the suffering of someone still bound in samsara is comparable to the size of the great earth. And then the next sutra is, you know, what do you think is greater, amongst this drop of water or all the, the waters of the seven great oceans? <laughs> and then, you know, on and on and on, each of these sort of uh, examples where one very, very tiny, small thing and one huge, vast, immeasurable thing are compared with each other. So the Buddha certainly promoted very actively, you know, the work of of arriving at stream entry, and uh, also uh, it's something that um, that I think is worth bearing in mind because sometimes we think of of enlightenment, you know, full enlightenment of arahantship as this sort of that's the goal of the path, and, and yet that seems so extraordinarily remote and, and distant and, and far off, like you know, sort of Olympic performance, you know, kind of medita- you know meditation Olympics standard. The kind of stellar, impossible heights of uh, of uh, ability, but uh, sometimes, and, and you know, we are we we do like to, to sort of go for the best, don't we? We don't sort of really want to pussyfoot around and <laughs> go for the sort of mediocre, half baked, um, you know, junior league stuff. We like premier, number one, super duper, vajra, five star. She's probably not quite the same in England. We. Certainly, in in the, in the U.S., there's definitely a love for the the the, the most ultimate, uh, keenest, sharpest, highest, bestest. We like that, don't we? It kind of lifts us up. Uh, but yet, if we, we if we work in, or look in that that way in spiritual terms, then it can seem like you know we're staring up this five thousand foot cliff, thinking, "Oh dear." impossible and never going to make it. But if instead we sort of lower the gaze a little bit and say, well, okay, rather than looking up at the, you know, the top of the 5,000 foot cliff, let's, okay, is there a ledge? <laughs> Can I clamber up to that ledge? Oh, well, that looks kind of doable. If I just sort of go onto that boulder and then hang onto that bush and then go up to that little crevice and then clamber over there. And, oh, yeah, that's, that's doable. So that... Um, yeah, I would really encourage this, um, you know, seeing that this is a, a reasonable goal for, for all of us human beings to, to aim towards, uh, not just to sort of cultivate a, a sort of achievement-oriented mentality, 
but just to see that this is uh, a worthy aim uh, for a human life, and certainly doable. Certainly doable. There's a, a very one, a kind of unique sutta uh, also in the Sangyutta Nikaya, which is um, about uh, um, one of the Sakyans called Sarakani, and in Morris Walsh's translation of this sutra is called Sarakani who took to drink. So it's one of those interesting ones. <laughs> and so um, Sarakani was a, a disciple of the Buddha who had somewhat fallen away from the path and become a drunk, you know, a famous drunk around Kapilavatu. And then, um, even though he would sort of still come around the temple and, and you know, visit the Buddha and be around, he was a sort of notorious drunkard. And then... Um, when he finally died, as they do, you know, as I was saying earlier, people would come to the Buddha and say, where has so-and-so been reborn? Just like the Buddha was getting a bit weary of Ananda asking him. So when Sarakani uh, uh, finally keeled over and <laughs> breathed his last, then uh, some of the Sakyans, uh, I think it was Mahanama, who was the, uh, the, the king of the Sakyans, was talking to the Buddha and said, so, you know, Venerable Sir, where did Sarakani, who took to drink, where did, where did, he, where did he end up? And then the Buddha said, well, Sarakani, um, uh, Sarakani the Sakyan, he, um, when he was a, when he passed away, he was a stream enterer, so he's, um, bound for enlightenment, no longer subject to perdition. What? <laughs> but he gave up on the path. I mean, he fell away. He was a drunk. You know, he can't possibly be a stream enterer. And then, uh, and so then, uh, word quickly spread around, um, uh, Kapilavatu. And the, the the gossip spread about, gee, anyone can become, it seems like anybody can become a stream enterer these days. You know, really devalued it. You know, even Sarakani, who was a hopeless drunk, you know, the Buddha's even declared him to be a stream enterer. It's like, you know, gee, the, you know, the pound's gone right down. <laughs> even a hopeless lush like him can, can, can get, um, the, uh, kind of, the, the green light from the master. So then, uh, Mahanama goes to the Buddha and says, you know, kind of, sir, you know, I'm puzzled because <laughs> surely, you know, that, uh, it must be the case that, you know, you know well, I, that Sarakani couldn't really be a stream enterer and, you know, be free from the lower realms. I mean, after all, you know, he fell away from the path and he became a drunkard. And then, uh, the, the Buddha then describes, you know, these different levels of, uh, of, um, realization of faith and commitment for, for, uh, and what qualify would qualify one as a stream enterer, and then he goes through these having different degrees of wisdom and and faith and and so forth. So even someone without without you know, acute states of wisdom, even someone without um, uh, a deep quality of of um, uh, you know faith and uh, commitment to the to the practice. He, he said, and he goes through his whole list of, of seven different levels. I won't to bore you with, but um, he said, uh, but even if one, the Sarakani, uh, uh, you know, so even if one simply has love for the Tathagata, even if there's just, just that amount, if there's just uh, that veneration, uh, a love for the for the Tathagata, that, uh, that alone, even if everything else is missing, <laughs> the whole rest of the, the thing is shot, if you just have, if one has love of, for the Tathagata, devotion to the Tathagata, that is enough to qualify one as a stream enterer. He said, even, Mahanama, even if these sala trees here, if they could be said to have you know, su- such love for the Tathagata, I too would declare that these sala trees were bound for enlightenment, no longer subject to, to perdition, and could be ranked as stream enterers. And he said, Sarakani um, fulfilled the training at the time of his death. So, even though he was a, a falling down drunk, even at the time of his, just that as he, you know, from the way the story goes, just as uh, at the time of his death came, that he was able to, uh, to reflect on and to be, um, able to bring to mind that, you know, no matter how, you know, how far I lost it and, and, and missed the path, you know, I love the Buddha. And he was, you know, he was the the one the one good true thing in the in the world. I mean, I can't. I'm just sort of guessing with that kind of thing that uh, Sarakani would have established his heart in that devotion and 
and love and trust in the Buddha. And that was enough to get him under the fingernail rather than <laughs> just lumped him with, the, with, the, with the, all of the, the rest of the great earth. So, well, I'm saying this so to realize it's not impossible. I'm not encouraging everyone to go back to the bottle. <laughs> well, that might be tempting, sort of, on day four or five of a retreat within the, a little anesthetic for those knees. <laughs> little medicinal uh, brandy. Or <laughs> it's not that I'm, I'm advocating a return to the bottle and just sort of risking, well, if I can just remember that, you know, that to love the Buddha at that last moment, hey, this is, that's great. You know? <laughs> well, um, personally, I wouldn't risk it. <laughs> but uh, that was the case for Sarakani. But... Um, it's a bit of a uh, a chancy <laughs> a chancy affair, but just so that one can recognise that that it's it's a, a a goal that needs to be worked for. It's a, certainly stream entry is not anything to be uh, sort of uh, looked upon as as kind of uh, a piece of cake or something that's sort of easy and. And uh, straightforward. It, it, there's 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 effort, there's work involved there, but also just to be encouraged that it's not beyond the scope of of anybody in this room. You know, Lung Po Cha would would often say that uh, you know if you have enough faith and interest to, to show up at the monastery and to even think of taking the precepts, you know that that uh, just that amount of uh, of faith and interest you know shows that you know, you have the capacity. Uh, there's the the seeds there. There's the the um, potential there for for realizing that uh, that goal, <coughs> that possibility. Yeah. That's why he also he would get even get the novices um, to give dhamma talks. And people say, well, how can a novice, you know, or even the anagarikas have you know wise things to say? Said, how can they be teaching dhamma? He said, well, look, if they had enough wisdom to make the gesture of renunciation to shave their head and, and take on the precepts. They've got enough wisdom to uh, to share with others. So this is all just in, by way of encouragement, not, not underestimate the uh, capacity that we have and that the patience and, uh, and endurance and commitment that, that everyone here has shown survived you know, four or five days of, of retreat. And um, this is no small thing. And probably some of you are, are feeling... Damn right. <laughs> not even not small. It's big. You know, it's, it's a lot. It takes a lot. And so it's easy for our critical mind, our self, the, the kind of inner tyrant, the inner critics, you know, those, those kind of grumpy members of the committee, to say, you know, who do you think you are? You know, you're no good. And you're useless. And he's not talking about you. It's all these others <laughs> that he means. It's not really you. We're not kind of wretched little you, you know, you the failure, me the hopeless one, me who's passed it, me who's sort of got, really got a bit missing. <laughs> you know, that, and it's all the others, those kind of ones that are so serene and peaceful, emanating loving kindness with every breath, <laughs> haven't got problems like me, or kind of nasty habits like me that no one else knows about. So just be able to, in exactly the same way, to say, well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> As we say in California. Thank you for sharing. But uh, <laughs> duly noted. And just let them be part of the committee. And you don't don't um, give the, those voices the, uh, the chair. <laughs> Leave uh, mindfulness and wisdom as the, uh, the chair of the committee. Just say, listen to... You know, Learning to listen is like listening to those voices of the inner critic and that self-disparaging uh, habit. To say, okay, that's one view of it. Just as the inflated egomaniac is, <laughs> I'm the one. <laughs> it's me he's talking about. <laughs> what do you mean stream entry? Pa, that was last week. <laughs> hey, you know, it's anagami or bust by Friday. Yeah, thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Messiah by Sunday. 
Yes, duly noted. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now. back in your chair. <laughs> so we learn to listen to all the different members of the committee and just take it all in and say, all that arises passes away is not self. You know, it's another voice, another thought, a feeling comes, it goes, it changes. That's all. That's the path. Just to know that much. So, I offer this for consideration this evening. Oh, there was a request. Do we do requests? <laughs> An old Beatles number called the Meta Sutra in Pali. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't e- it doesn't exist in the chanting book that you all have. But um, so maybe some people know it. There was a request: Would it be possible for us to chant the Meta Sutra in Pali? And is there a chant slash mantra? Four question mark. Um, Sabha papas akaranang. Well, that's uh, that's the um, uh, the party most the um, um, the discourse that the Buddha gave on the first Manga Puja, the Ovada Pati Moka, which also isn't in these chanting books. So um, we could do these, uh, but it would just be the monastics and the some of the monastics probably, <laughs> and maybe a few of you who know those. Or we could call upon our wonderful managers to print up some copies of the uh, Metta Sutta in Pali and the Ovada Patimoka for a future day. And then we could pass those out and then we could chant them on a different day. Yeah? Okay. So we'll just uh, go with the old uh, Metta Sutta in English to finish the evening. I think it would be suitable. Thank you.